Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly webinar, Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing databases versus Hadoop versus cloud storage. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADV Analytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William is the president of McKnight Consulting Group. He takes corporate information and turns it into a bottom line producing asset. He's working with major companies worldwide, 15 of the global 2000 and many others. McKnight Consulting Group focuses on delivering business value and solving business problems utilizing proven, streamlined approaches in information management. His teams have won several best practice competitions for their implementations. He has been helping companies adopt big data solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Shannon. And welcome to everyone all over the world who joins these webinars. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, bring this information to you. Hope you enjoy it and uh, can make some use out of it. This is a hot topic. Uh, a lot of companies out there are scrambling now to make sure that they're in the right data platform for their workloads. And the choices are, are uh, incompatible to anything that we've ever had, really. I mean, the viable choices. So you can get it right, and, or you can get it wrong, really. Uh, and this is one of the most important decisions, not just for the data of the project, the data layer, but for the whole project, for the success of the whole project. And there's a lot of things that fall on from this decision of what platform to you. So I'm very excited to be bringing with you a topic that's uh, burning up my ears, uh, which is databases versus Hadoop versus cloud storage, which to use, when, where, how, etc. So uh, I've been introduced, uh, so I'll skip on this. And my company, we uh, do a lot of strategy for our clients out there. Uh, we give training uh, workshops to nail a particular issue you may be having. Uh, by bringing in expertise um, and also, uh, obviously, implementation of all the things we're talking about here. And by the way, I'll add that I've been doing a lot of field work recently. Uh, I should say field testing recently on a lot of the products that will be implicated in such a comparative uh, presentation such as this. So uh, I do bring you up to the minute, uh, hands-on experience with a lot of these products and, and um, got, been through the thought pattern, I guess you might say, of uh, making this decision with our clients. Yeah, all data. Used to be give me some data, give it to me fast. Okay, great. We didn't have data warehousing back then. Uh, we weren't thinking that way. We were provisioning uh, rapidly and repeatedly and getting kind of crazy there with it. And then uh, data warehousing got, got some things together for us in the 2000s. Uh, I was around for all of this. And so I've seen it change. And now it's all data. Give it to me fast and effectively. Don't let any data slip slip away uh, without us getting the value out of that data. And usually, that doesn't mean just looking at the data or processing the data. It also means storing the data for current and quite potentially future uses of that data. And one of the biggest areas has got to be artificial intelligence. So I'll hit on that in a minute. But first, I want to say this guy has nothing on us in the data business. Uh, this is Mr. Toad. He's got a wild ride over there at Disney, apparently. Um, but we've been on a wild ride ourselves, and uh, we're all scrambling trying to uh, make sense of it. And not only um, is the landscape changing as we speak, but uh, it's changing rapidly. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to throw a wrench out there and uh, see what you like, uh, see, see if you like it. But uh, I'll be talking about maybe some future direction of data platforms. But uh, for the majority of this presentation, I'm going to be firmly grounded in the present, firmly grounded as I am with our clients in terms of making decisions today. We have to make decisions today. My motto is you can't keep delaying the provisioning of 
a platform for this workload just because you think there's something around the corner. There's always something around the corner. And uh, you have to take that into consideration if you kind of know what that is. Uh, that may factor into your decision. But as you can see, it's a multifaceted decision, and I want us to make it, make it properly. So uh, be prepared for the wild ride that uh, will continue uh, to be in this space. We're getting ready for AI out there. And AI data means all data. It means call center recordings and chat logs, streaming sensor data, et cetera. I won't read it all, but user website behaviors, sentiment analysis, all data. And so I have clients that their, their data science isn't quite ready for it, but they know that that science, when it is ready, will want data because it already does in many different ways. And so we're getting our data act together. We're getting our data together. Uh, we're getting it into a manageable, uh, architected format because as things happen in your business, as things happen uh, uh, that affect your business and you want to react to that, if you have a chaotic environment with mismatched data to platform, you're going to have a much harder time. And if you don't understand where things are and what the level of say quality is in the various places and what you can do with data in various places, uh, you're going to have a really hard time. So this is all kind of what I call architecture, what we call architecture. It's putting the get data together in the right way and getting it into the right platform is a big part of that. I want to stress this before we jump in further, which is this is about the proximate pr proportion of where we should be spending our time and energy in an enterprise. Yeah, on the data, mostly. It's not what really happens, unfortunately, and I, I do believe companies pay the price for uh, trying to continue to just access data however it may, may be in the enterprise. Get that data act together, and then you can slap any good old BI or AI on top of a great data foundation and get some return on investment out of that. If you have a uh, chaotic data foundation, again, you're going to have a hard time getting anything out of it. And people will just kind of walk away and go back to the old ways. They won't use the data, and we don't want that. If you believe, as I do, that data is a critical asset of the business, you have to take care of it in this way. And by the way, all the things I'm going to be talking about here today, the architecture, the platforms, and so on, Let's be sure that data is perceived as an asset so you get the uh, right attention over to these platforming issues. Because otherwise, if data is seen as a commodity, as a, as a drag along, if you will, to applications, as it is still many places, uh, you're going to have challenges at getting the data in the right platform, getting your company really ready for the future. That's what this is about. There is an increasing probability that if you do the correct platform selection that will lead to success of the overall project. And this is not based on a study. This is, this is just my impression of 20 years of consulting and data that if you just kind of throw a dart at the board and you just use the same old platform that you've always used. I mean, I've been in uh, application specification workshops uh, where we're talking about the application. It's all great. I assume we're going to spend about the same amount of time talking about the data and five minutes to go in the meeting. And it's like, uh, John, would you provision another, uh, insert your favorite vendor uh, database instance uh, for this? And that's it. Hey, um, whoa, what happened there? Uh, we, just, uh, we just made a very quick uh, decision based upon not really thinking about it. And that's not the way to go about it. So... I want you to get into not only the right category, not only the right top two category, but the best category. And by category, I mean the subject of today's talk, a database. Yeah, and there's different uh, categories within there, of course. We'll get into that. Hadoop, uh, still very viable out there, and then cloud storage and other, other things, okay? So get into the right category and get into the right tool. And believe it or not, I believe there is a best tool specific vendor tool for every application and that you really increase your odds uh, for success of that application if you get into that. There's still enough diversity in, uh, in let's say, cloud and lake databases. There's still enough diversity to matter. And there's still a lot of uh, positioning happening out there in that marketplace. For example, there's still a lot of 
differentiation. And I've been doing a lot of research lately in this area, uh, comparing the various uh, platforms, not only from a performance standpoint, but from a feature function standpoint. And I can certainly attest that uh, we can aw award some, um, some, uh, some different gold medals to each of the participants <laughs> for different things, right? Best performance over here, you got your best uh, backup and recovery over here, you got your best security over here, and so on. So what's important to you? Let's get into that. Uh, as we get into provisioning your application. So what's it for? What are, we, what are we wanting a data platform for? What is it? It's not a database. There are categories. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm putting aside anybody that wants to do something on, you know, tape or something like that, okay? We're squarely in, in modern architecture here. So an operational database. Now, you'll see some words in here, operational. Uh, hopefully we know what that means as contrasted with the analytical side of the business. An operational database. Hey, this is where it all began. This is where databases began, just running the business, doing accounts receivable, doing transactions and so on. Oh yeah, we still do that, by the way. That's still pretty important. But one aspect of operational, or there's a few that have changed, but one that's changed is the need for real time, like real time catalogs for e-commerce and so on, that throws a wrench into the decision process and to me changes the game in terms of the database that you might select. So is it that? Is it big data? And it could be a combination of real time and big data. But in the first three categories, mostly here I'm talking about provisioning for a single application in the operational realm. And then the fourth category is an operational data hub, which has gained some prominence re recently. It's almost like the data lake, but it's not quite. It's, re it's really operational in the sense that it's serving up data to a lot of different applications for operational processing, all right, real-time processing in many cases. And it's doing multiple. So are, y are you provisioning a database for operational purposes for something like that? That's an operational data hub. You're doing that. Master data management? Yeah, that's an operational database too. That's, that's a relational database. Uh, a data warehouse. Oh yeah, data warehouse. Now we're flipping to the analytical side of things. Post-operational, where a lot of uh, activity has happened recently. It's a very, imp very important part of, the, part of the enterprise. Of course, a data warehouse, of course, so important. I'll come back to that. Um, a dependent data mart, a data mart that is fed from the uh, dependent, uh, excuse me, fed from the data warehouse. It can all, there could also be an independent um, data mart, which is viable in certain cases, uh, somewhat uh, uh, congruent with an analytic big data application, although it does, although that's for big data, not necessarily the non-big data, okay? So independent data mart, non-big data, analytic big data application, big data. I believe big data is a thing. I don't mind using the words. Uh, some people do. They say, oh, it's just data. It's, no, it's data with different characteristics altogether. And so you have to do something different about that. And I'll get into that. A data lake, I skipped over that. A data lake, okay, these have gained a lot of prominence recently. I think they have a, a lot of value in an enterprise. I hope to impress a little bit about that on you today. But if you want my take on data lakes, uh, that was the topic of last month's advanced analytics webinar. Um, that's all I talked about. So uh, and go back, maybe find that in the archive, uh, all about data lakes. Uh, archive storage, some people provision just for that. Okay, that's not too exciting, but yeah, you gotta do that too. And that's, uh, that's a, a whole decision, I mean a whole uh, list of vendor uh, products that are specialists in that area. Uh, and also a staging, or you might be staging for, now famously we stage for the data warehouse, but these other things may have staging as well, which is where you might be doing some uh, initial data quality work, uh, cleanup work, um, transformation work uh, before the data is ready. And in some, in some cases, in most cases, I would say for a data warehouse, it does require that extra step to get it right. Okay. This boils down to three major decisions. The data store type. So the type is, to me, it's either databases or non-databases, what I call file-based systems, file-based scale-out systems. And largely there I'm talking about Hadoop, cloud storage, NoSQL, the things that aren't SQL, 
um, whereas databases are SQL. Uh, I believe SQL's here to stay, by the way. I, I certainly make my decisions based upon that. I see no evidence uh, to the contrary, and I'll be getting into that a little bit later. But not every application, not every provisioning needs to have what a database brings to the table. And databases have been around for 25 years, you know, relational databases or longer. And uh, they do a lot of things, but they do provide a lot of structure. And we, we have learned in recent years of some of the shortcomings of databases. So sometimes you don't need what a database brings. And you don't want to pay for it. Uh, data store placement. And I'm not really talking too much about this today, but anything and everything that I say today, you can throw a cloud uh, dimension on top of that and say, well, should that be in the cloud or not? So this is an important part of the provisioning cycle. And as a matter of fact, I think next month I'm going to talk about the cloud. Uh, it's pretty important, you know, whether you uh, put things in the cloud or not. Uh, my uh, take is that that is the future. That is where my clients want to go. Um, that's where I take them. And that's where that, that has the pole position as far as I'm concerned, that we are going to do this in the cloud. Convince me not, okay? The workload architecture, because there's still a differentiation, although it's blurring, between operational and analytical. So those three decisions kind of get you into the right set of tools, and then we want to drill in from there. Let's start by looking at probably what most data professionals uh, work on a lot. Data warehouses, data marts, data lakes, and generally big data. So let's talk about the analytical side of doing what we do. And oh, by the way, I, I failed to mention a point here earlier when I was talking about operational data. I wanted to say that um, this could be SQL. This could also be new SQL, or it could also be no SQL. Okay, so those are some of the categories that are viable for the operational workload. And a lot of, um, by the way, a lot of databases these days also have NoSQL-like capabilities. The capability to store JSON as regular data, uh, et cetera. So that takes a lot of the, um, that's taken up a lot of the slack out there. And um, so we'll see what, what happens with NoSQL. I don't believe I will come back to NoSQL very much more in this presentation. Okay, data warehousing. Yeah, still has lower co total cost of ownership than data marts. Uh, and I've been dragging around uh, this, this thing from Gartner in the lower right-hand corner because I like it, and it, it, it tells the story. And I don't know what they mean by however many data marts they're talking about there, but you get the idea that if you keep doing one-offs at some point, it's going to cost more. And uh, I would say not only does it cost more, and that's not good, but it also is going to leave you without the capabilities of a shared resource like a data warehouse. So. We love data warehouses. Uh, as a matter of fact, of all the things I'm going to talk about here today, if you don't have your data warehouse up to a certain standard, that's probably the place that you can get the most bang for the buck out of your data environment. So you should prob probably be uh, focused on your data warehouse. I know, I know it's yesterday's news, right? Not, not so interesting anymore, but it provides so much value to an organization. And so we're going to talk about provisioning for the data warehouse. Let's put it in an ecosystem here first. Uh, it's going to be next to Hadoop, you know, as I say, next to, uh, in that tier of the analytic architecture. Now, that Hadoop could be for an application, a big data application, could be for a data lake. And also, I show you some other appliances out there, some independent data marts, some dependent data marts. Yeah, all of the above. Um, there's no right and wrong in terms of this, because I encounter clients with no two clients are the same out there. No two of you are the same in terms of what you've done. And by the way, none of you have implemented the nice laminated architectures that the vendors used to wag in your face uh, in the past decade. Uh, not quite. Uh, and most of you are pretty di divergent from that. But hey, I'm not taking anything away from those laminated architectures, those reference architectures. I think you should have a reference architecture that you're targeting out there sometime in the next five years or so. And that helps you make your decisions because getting to that reference architecture is part of the decision-making criteria for provisioning anything. Um, so you should have that. And yes, it should have a data lake. It should have a data warehouse. It should show your prominent data marts in there and the other things I'm going to be talking about uh, here today. So anyway, um, my point
basically the data warehouse sits in an analytic ecosystem. Some people call the whole thing a, a logical data warehouse. Okay, great if you want to. Um, I tend to be physical. I call that data warehouse that uh, you know that physical database that we're calling the data warehouse. And yes, there might be staging. Yes, it might feed some data marts, um, but that's what they are. That's what it is. Now, I've noticed something. Data warehousing has been around for so long, right? Um, data warehouses now seem to have a lot of seem to have what I call flavors out there in the marketplace, and that's perfectly okay. It's perfectly okay if your data warehouse is not the do-all, end-all, be-all for analytic data in your organization because it's hard to do that, really hard. And so many organizations have multiple of these data warehouses, and some of them have taken on multiple of these flavors, and some take on one flavor, and you have multiple of them. Yeah, all of the above. But these are some of the flavors that I've seen in data warehouses recently. And yes, the flavor could impact the decision of how you're going to uh, um, provision for the data warehouse. The customer experience transformation, people are doing that with their data warehouse. Asset maximization, a lot of IoT interrelated to those data warehouses. Operational extension data warehouses that do things that we should be doing in the operations, but we can't for various reasons. Risk management has become huge recently. Finance modernization, all the financial uh, numbers, uh, and product innovation. And the reason that one last reason, then I'll move on here. But one last reason that I bring up these flavors of data warehouses is because maybe the ideal out there is to have a couple of different data warehouses with different flavors because maybe it's just hard to meet all these needs in one data warehouse. I don't know. That's kind of what I'm seeing, though. But do have data warehouses, which are shared resources at the end of the day. It's shared. It's not for one application. Just because you're provisioning a database uh, on the analytic side of things doesn't mean that that's a data warehouse. Um, okay, let's move on. What is required in all these analytic databases? The ability to do analytics inside the database, okay? The ability to store uh, data in memory, uh, the ability to have a columnar orientation to that data. That's uh, pretty important. Now, I'm, I'm going to come back on that. Modern programming languages, yeah, all the data science languages that are, are now in vogue and very interesting and making a difference in organizations. You want that. You want the ability to store different data types. I mentioned JSON before, uh, Avro, XML, on and on. Uh, the new data types that we're seeing out there in a lot of exchange environments, if nowhere else, um, these, these, you, you know, your analytic database should have the ability to store that kind of data. Some of the major decisions that you need to make uh, are, okay, uh, where to store the data. I mentioned this a little bit ago. Now, I'm not saying, let's well, store a lot of data in memory, but I think you should be, uh, if I had a general piece of advice uh, that I've um, built up over working with so many clients is that they don't use enough memory. Uh, that, that a little bit more memory can take a lot of clients' uh, performance uh, up dramatically. Now, that's using memory. This, is, this graph is talking about where to store the data. So what this is saying is low amounts of data. And in their case, I mean, this can go up to 100 terabytes. Okay, so let's take that with a grain of salt. But in low amounts of, grade, of, of data with a high query rate, then you might be storing in memory. And then somewhere in between SSD, which is really where, really the sweet spot, I'd say, for where analytic data should be stored today, okay? And then, of course, you have this for some of the data that uh, maybe it's legacy, maybe you're not doing very much with it, et cetera, high volume, low query rate, yeah, disk for that. That's a, this is an important decision, by the way. It's not good enough to just say, okay, well, we've analyzed everything and we've decided Oracle, Okay, well, go on, <laughs> because what about, you know, the makeup of the storage layer for Oracle? That's pretty important now, too. That can make or break your workload right there. So you have to keep going. Uh, it's not as easy as it used to be. And the columnar orientation. And um, if you've heard me over the years, you know I'm really big on this and have done a lot of, uh, of work in the columnar area. Uh, most analytic databases have a columnar capability, um, and uh, what this does is it uh, isolates uh, columns of data in its own storage 
areas, okay? So when that's all you want, that's all you get. Just those, those columns, that's all you'll get in the processing and in, 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 in the visualization part, whatever. Uh, it doesn't have to hit and doesn't have to deal with every other column of every table that you might be touching, okay? And it's very important. And I have uh, done studies and found that most data warehouses, let alone in Lake Marts, them too, but most data warehouses really would do, would do well and do better in a columnar orientation. Now, I know that you're going to, um, you're, you're, you're thinking, wow, that's a big deal, though. I've got 10 constituent parties in the data warehouse. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, could you plan a weekend, you know, sometime later in the year, maybe to twist your data in a columnar direction and, and boost most of them? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you have to provision something else, which has led me to this notion that, you know, there is the data warehouse, but then there is the specialist database in the analytic realm for specialist workloads that, that can't fit in the data warehouse for one reason or another. And in my work recently, I would say at least 50% of the workloads that we're dealing with in the analytic, analytic realm, not even talking about big data here, but because of the concurrency requirements, because of the access requirements, the, the deep data science maybe that might be happening on that data, or just the volume of the data, the veracity of the data, et cetera, you know, they, they just can't fit in the data warehouse anymore. So that's okay. You know, spinning up uh, some independent data marts that um, are alongside the data warehouse. But now, yes, I'm putting a, a ribbon on, on this slide because if there was one area that is, is, if you're looking for, if you came to this webinar looking for the answer <laughs> to, you know, the question of, Hadoop versus databases versus whatever else I had. The answer is cloud and lake databases. And uh, I'm not saying that generally for everything, okay? Don't get me wrong. But for a lot of things out there that I know you're mulling over, uh, cloud and lake databases are going to be uh, front and center uh, in terms of things that you need to really be thinking about. So, uh, yes, I, there is that word in there, isn't there? Cloud. Yeah, cloud. Um, these belong in the cloud. Uh, these have some of the things that you see here. Robust SQL, built-in optimization, on-the-fly elasticity. You don't have to think about it. It just expands and contracts as it needs to, and you pay for what you use, which um, price uh, predictability is huge in terms of what I'm asked about uh, as, as we provision uh, data platforms for our clients. Um, and, and, and clients are even willing to accept a higher price if they can, if they can predict it because they have to do this thing called a budget. So um, put that, I'll just put that out there. Dynamic environment adaption, separation of compute from storage. Yeah, that's really necessary today. That's really necessary. You need to be taking advantage of that. Now, this came from the Hadoop world, um, and they got into it first, but a lot of these cloud and lake databases now have that. Support for diverse data, I mentioned this a little bit ago, still uh, very important. Cloud and lake databases in the enterprise. Now, the cloud aspect is, is what's important here for some of these benefits, and just the database aspect is important for some of the other ones. But this one, I'm talking mostly about the fact that it's in the cloud. The fact that it's in the cloud can be used for test dev or prod, disaster recovery, Yep, whoops, uh, or, or bursting, so that you have some of the workload in cloud, some on-prem. CapEx accounting, of course, we love this. Our accounting department loves this. Uh, the cloud now offers attractive options with better economics, such as pay-as-you-go, which is easier to justify and budget. You can get up and running quicker, which is very important today. The, I know for me, the cycles of getting a client up and running have shrunk dramatically from years ago when it used to be, you know, an elongated RFP process, et cetera, et cetera. If you've been around, you know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> but now um, it's more like, let's think about it a little bit. Let's get it right. Let's spin it up and let's try it out. And if it doesn't work, let's, let's jettison that and get something else going. And I encourage everybody, though, to not, you know, be so flippant about it and, and actually do run your own uh, proofs of concepts uh, internally, um, pretty much 
I kind of described a proof of concept there, but uh, to do it a little bit formally and uh, to have some competition in the mix. While on-premises first development brings a robust database to the table, not all functions are always part of the cloud solution, so be careful about that. And today there's a lot of data gravity in the cloud because there's so many other applications that are out there in the cloud that we are enjoying. So what did I, now what did I call this? Hadoop versus uh, databases versus uh, cloud storage. What's the winner? What's the winner in terms of performance? Managed cloud databases are the winner for performance. There you go. You got a, you got a straight answer from a consultant, okay? Um, today must be your lucky day. Um, but querying cloud storage directly is inefficient and bringing subsets of data down for on-premise processing takes time and costs egress fees. Okay, this is what we found. Now, by the way, just because it's better at performance doesn't mean it's right for everything. I hope you get that. All right, I'm just picking on one thing here. Performance testing on Hadoop engines like Hive, Spark, and Impala have shown improvements in performance, but they still lag significantly behind the performance and power of a solid relational cloud database slash data warehouse. Now, if I had uh, maybe if I had a better slide in here, I would show you that that kind of that line between database and non-database uh, has been pushed up a little bit. So database keeps gaining ground, and uh, this is this is interesting because a few years ago, weren't we all talking about well? No, actually, it's, it's Hadoop that's going to push down into the realm of the database, right? And it's, going to be, it's going to be for everything, right? Um, it's, it's, it's going a little bit the other way now, but there's still that top end where some other things make sense, and we'll get into that a little bit. But there you go. Uh, how about administration? That's pretty important. Now the DBAs and the, the, the people that manage this aspect of it, uh, they care about this. Manage cloud databases win this category too. What do you know? Many of the latest and greatest fully managed cloud database platforms are streamlining and subsuming much of the DBA work these days. Uh, yeah, there is that march. Uh, we could have a separate, complete discussion about um, what we're going to do uh, in the data world in the next uh, five to 10 years, but this is one aspect of it. DBA work is shrinking. Things like indexes, constraints, partitioning, and other DBA level performance tuning are fading away. Many of these cloud databases do not have those things. You don't, you don't touch uh, any of this. It just happens. Now, second in administration is cloud storage because of its very simple architecture. I didn't say it was simple to provision. I'll get to that. But it's simple ar in, in terms of architecture. It's basically a file layout. And last place is Hadoop. You will still need expertise to help diagnose why Spark executors fail, which they do or Hive throws an exception, which it does, or why troublesome queries never finish. And um, depending upon your query set, that could very well be happening to you as it has with us. However, there are reasons why you want big data technologies for big data. OK, so if your workload is square on into big data, which I've mentioned is a thing, is uh, characteristically different than our legacy non-big data. It really is. The volume's at another level. Uh, the data types are different, uh, to say least. And uh, what did I say? I said the volumes are at a different level. The volume that comes in, the, the, the interesting nature of the data, it's less you know, per, per byte, if you will. But it's still important. And this is actually an area of gaining competitive advantage in the marketplace. So, we do want big data technologies for big data because of the things that you see here and plenty of other things. And by the way, um, if you have extreme unstructured data, you might be uh, needing to do something different than just even Hadoop or cloud storage. You might need a product like Amazon Cloud Search, Elastic, Solar, Sphinx, or Splunk for your extreme unstructured data. If, if, if the overriding uh, aspect or criteria of the workload is the fact that there's a lot of unstructured data, yeah, you might be in that realm instead of in Hadoop or cloud storage. That might be what makes sense. But let's talk about the data lake. There's a lot of talk about the data lake out there. And uh, some of it's good, some of it's not so good. But I believe that the data lake has a tremendous amount of value to organizations. It supplements the data warehouse. It's not the data warehouse. It's not for your everyday reporting. It's not for 
the 70% or some odd of queries that your, an organization needs to run, um, which that's the data warehouse, okay? But this will be an increasing percentage of the queries that an organization needs to run as data scientists increase within the organization. And hopefully you are embracing this. If you're a mid-sized company, you're up. You need to be embracing data science today. And you need to be uh, showing uh, how you are going to be competing in data science out there in the marketplace. And I would say that the window is closing a little bit now already for those prime movers, those companies that will be data science leaders. And I think that's pretty important in terms of overall viability of company. So uh, get your data act together so that you can effectively have data scientists and they will want a, a data lake. Uh, I promise you this. This is uh, what I found over and over again. And uh, yeah, there's, and, and a data lake, I don't want to say it's all data. That sounds, you know, kind of too, too easy to say, hard to do, but it's a, it's a lot of data. It's, it's more data than the warehouse. As you can see in this snippet of architecture, I believe the lake is a great staging ground for uh, the data warehouse and quite potentially other data marts as well. Uh, so the big question out there though, uh, after you get past the yes, we want to do a data lake is where HDFS or Hadoop, which is HDFS is pretty much what the term Hadoop has come to mean in recent years. But just, let's be sure that we're on the same page when you're out there talking about Hadoop um, with other people. Uh, or cloud storage, HDFS or cloud storage. Now, the early days of the data lake, which wasn't that long ago, but it feels like uh, there's been some sea changes. In the early days, uh, Hadoop was it, right? Hadoop was everything, um, uh, every data lake. And it still is the majority of data lakes out there. It has to be because unless you provision really recently, that's what you did. Uh, but cloud storage really... Uh, took the scene lately, and my clients are telling me this is what they want to look at. I'm lo I've been doing uh, some um, field testing on this, and uh, believe that cloud storage. At the end of the day, I believe that cloud storage is probably the most elegant place to put your data lake uh, these days. It's more scalable and persistent. It's backed up, and it supports compression, making the cost less. Now, HDFS does have better query performance, so I'll leave that out there. But um, cloud storage is closing the gap on that. And it used to be that you were not able to use Parquet and Orc in cloud storage, which uh, you know my columnar uh, orientation, so I feel like that's pretty important. But now we do things like we make external tables for the database pointing at Parquet files on S3. Of course, that's uh, Amazon's cloud storage. Now the cloud storage does have object size and single put limits that need workarounds, but uh, we can do that. So um, I'm putting forward cloud storage for your data lakes. And how about this? Just an, uh, uh, an elegant uh, design idea for you. Pair a lake with an analytical engine that charges only by what you use, which is a lot of them these days. If you have a ton of data that can sit in cold storage and only needs to be accessed or analyzed occasionally, stored in Amazon S3, Azure Blob Storage, or Google Cloud Storage. Those are the three data lakes that we uh, have been working on. So that's, that's your body of selection there, I'd say, for that. Use a database on-prem or in the cloud that can create external tables that point at the storage. Analysts can then query directly against it or draw down a subset for some deeper intensive analysis. And the storage fee plus the data transfer egress fees will be much cheaper than leaving it all in a data warehouse. So this is a big idea that many are doing for the right workloads to save money. For example, S3 is two cent per gigabyte per for storage. If you had a hundred terabyte data set marked for cold storage, you could keep it in cloud storage for two thousand dollars a month. If your provision EBS general purpose drives to hold that data, it would cost ten thousand. If you used higher performance solid state drives with provisioned I/O, as you might in a good data warehouse, you would spend $12,500 a month on storage alone. So when it comes to cost, uh, this is a great way to work with cloud storage and databases. 
Hadoop would be second place in the cost equation. Um, hopefully you see cloud storage is first. Hadoop would be second place. For example, Amazon EMR cluster having nodes with 32 CPUs and 244 gig of RAM each would run about $1.50 per node per hour. Redshift for the same processing power would cost over three times as much at $4.80 per node per hour. But remember, I did say that those cloud analytic databases are really the fit for most of your workloads. You don't want to sacrifice the performance you need, the administration you, you need, just because something is cheaper. This is why I, 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 I dread the conversation, which is almost inevitable in any provisioning cycle that I get into, but I dread the conversation about, well, what's the cheapest way to store this, you know, uh, especially with the CFO office? What's the cheapest way to store this? That's not the way to look at it. But anyway, I imagine that for 80 to 85% of your use cases, you won't be able to beat a good cloud database or data warehouse platform for, when you look at everything taken together. We are still in those days of not one size fits all. We are still in the days where you have to get into the right category in order to succeed. Okay? So hopefully I'm clear about that, and that's why we have uh, talks like we have today, because there's still a, it's still a thing. So leveraging cloud storage for data lakes, more achievable separate compute and storage architecture. You've got compute resources that can be taken down, scaled up or out, or interchanged without data movement. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll point out the last bullet. Most of the query execution is processing time and not data transport. So if cloud compute and storage are in the same cloud vendor region, performance is hardly impacted. So that's another tip for you out there. And I think we had more tips like this last month, if you want to check that out, learn more about data lakes. Now a little uh, aside, because I couldn't leave them out. Because after all, in the first webinar in this series, Back in January, I did a little bit of a look ahead to 2019 and beyond. And I said that this year, uh, 2019, it's the year of MDM, uh, but it's also the year of the graph database. And so I believe that we're going to see a lot of graph databases deployed, or at least graph capabilities deployed as organizations take up this idea of a graph workload. Yeah, not trying to force fit it into a relational database anymore, because there's alternatives to that. So a workload. What's a graph workload? If you can identify the workload by the terms network, hierarchy, tree, ancestry, structure, if that's how you would describe it, uh, chances are uh, you're in a graph workload there. So you might want to think about it that way. If you're trying to use relational performance tricks like self-referencing tables and so on, we've all done it for years, those are not going to be necessary. You can get great performance traversing uh, a graph uh, much better than traversing uh, relational um, self-referencing tables, okay? Uh, what else do I want to point out here? I want to point out this, okay? So there's two types of graph databases. There's RDF graphs and there's property graphs like Neo4j. Um, there's some subtle differences between the two. There's some capability differences between the two, but um, for a, a large degree, I'd say, you get the same set of algorithms in both types, and they address this graph problem. Uh, and some of those algorithms are things like page rank. Page rank is very important. Now, let me just, I don't want to describe it. It would take too long, but let me just say about page rank that it's, it's emblematic of the algorithms in a graph database that show that the value of a graph database is not just solely in the visualization layer. We all see that, we enjoy that. Even on the, on the graph here, you can see in the lower right, I have a bunch of nodes and, and it looks great, right? Because you can zoom in on a node and you can see, oh, well, there's a so-called bridge vertex. You know, that's a connecting node between this group and that node, you can see it. And that's all great. But what's the most important nodes in the network for other reasons? And that can be identified with some of these graph algorithms like PageRank. PageRank is about, you know, what's the most important web page in a set of web pages or on the Internet uh, in total if you're Google, you know. Uh, betweenness, what's the way to get between? I'm reading some of the different graph algorithms here. What's the way to get between some of the nodes? Closeness, how close are a couple of the nodes on the network? And the nodes, by the way, they don't have to be all the same. They can be very um, heterogeneous. You can have, for example, people, you can have their products, you can have 
geographic locations and various other things in there as nodes. And again, get great performance traversing that graph. Eigen centrality, clustering coefficient, those are some of the main graph algorithms, at least in my, in my book. And those are some things you get only in uh, something that is provisioned with graph capabilities. And I almost said graph database, but that's not the only game in town anymore for graph capabilities. The relational database vendors have added a lot of graph capabilities. In many cases, what they have are the algorithms that I just mentioned. And you would point them at your, uh, your, your so-called nodes in your relational database. So you would say, well, here in this relational database, here are some of the nodes and here are some of the connections. And I hope I did justice to that topic in, in four minutes there. But uh, I thought it was pretty important when you're talking about platforming your workloads to put that out there and let you know there is that alternative as well. So if you're struggling with a workload that might be identified by these words, think about that. Okay, now let's step to the future. I like looking at the future too. Uh, remember now though, the, the advice I've given today so far is, a, is, is the advice that, um, that I would take up uh, now for the decisions that I know you're dealing with now. Uh, we cannot wait for this future. Um, what, we, what we can do is keep an eye on it. And every organization, upper midsize and up, should have people that are doing this, uh, should have people that have time to do this, and people that have capability to do this, and people that have the interest in doing this and applying it to the industry that you're in, applying it to the company that you're in, applying it to the architecture that you've already laid down, making sure that it fits. Now, first of all, I'm gonna mention the trend of GPU databases. A GPU database was engineered to work with GPUs, not CPUs. This is all about speed. And there's some, uh, some, of, the, some of the leaders there on the, across the bottom, Matt D, Scream, and Kinetica. And um, the reason I mentioned it is, uh, yeah, some of the other databases could and are working on being compatible with the GPU, which will take, take all our performance calculations today and throw them out the window. Uh, but it does take time and it does take uh, a dedication. And who knows uh, about some of these vendors if they are dedicated to this. I think this is a, a keeper, which is why I bring it up. Uh, you know, what I see. I think in the future, we're going to have a lot more GPUs in place in our enterprises. So that's important. What else? How about hybrid databases? Take, take you know, half of what I said today about the difference between operational and analytical and you provision differently for each. And, and uh, you might say, well, maybe in the future we don't have to. This, is, this industry is like an accordion where we started out with the database, okay, DB2 and Oracle back when, uh, it was, the accordion was closed. There wasn't many choices. And then in the past 10 years, that accordion opened way up and you've got all these choices. And I just talked about some of them. I didn't talk about some others that have gone by the wayside and that I would not deem viable uh, today for my clients. But now, what about the future? Will it close back up again? And will it, will it come back down to something that works across the board now that we recognize after 30 years that there's more to our business than the operational side. There is that very important analytical side. There's that pending AI that's uh, gonna have to happen. We're gonna have to make that transition. And uh, can that even be done uh, in, in, a current, in our current chaotic environment? Um, we'll see. But hybrid databases are a combination of row-based for transactions and column-based for analytics. Can process both, for example, orders and machine learning models simultaneously. Wow with fast performance and reduced complexity. So there are a few players out there doing this. There are some sprouts, I'll say, of activity in this area. And if you're a type A organization, uh, you may have some high-end combo applications already today that I would even say only a hybrid can do today. Today. But you better be type A and you better be ready for it. It's still SQL, by the way. Still SQL. Yeah, going into, the, going into our future still SQL. There's reduced complexity there, though, by having uh, both in one, right? I'm sure you'd agree with that. You talk, we're talking here about like what, and, and by the way, I'm going to read some names here. They're in no particular order. 
Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that all of them have all these capabilities I just talked about. But Splice Machine, Databricks, MemSQL, Actian, MapR, and Kudu. Uh, that's from Cloudera. That's their hybrid database, which does updates, inserts, and deletes on Hadoop data. Uh, Hortonworks used to used to bank on Hive for the acid merge functionality. Now I'm not I'm not sure what the direction is. Probably Kudu uh, from Cloudera. So anyway, that is definitely something to keep an eye on for your future, but not today, not today. I mean, for those high-end applications where you actually need this, yes. Otherwise, I'm recommending what I've been talking about in the past hour. Now, this brings me to the end of my, uh, the forum part of the presentation. Shannon, I see we have some questions. I'm going to let you take it away from here, though. Yeah, we have a lot of great questions coming in. And just to, um, oh, hey, I see lots of familiar names on there. Hey, um, <laughs> just to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation and anything else requested throughout. So then, William, diving right in, um, early on in the presentation, I think it was slide 14 or so, um, can you support multiple flavors in the warehouse? Absolutely, you can. Absolutely. Um, it gets trickier the more flavors that you, that you do try to support. Um, and not every business needs them all or needs a hyper-focus on all of them. But, uh, the, and, and don't get me wrong, there are some organizations out there that pulled off the whole EDW concept, um, and they have all flavors in one great unified data warehouse, which is great. It's just rare. That's all. And so what I see is more the, the flavoring of data warehouses. But yes, you can have multiple. And why don't you recommend leveraging Hadoop for a data warehouse? Oh, hmm. How long do we have? Um, <laughs> well, Listen. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> anyway, um, performance is one thing. Uh, complexity is another. Um, I mean, everything sort of falls from that. Um, provisioning uh, is another. I, I didn't mention too much about the work effort that goes into setting up these environments. And uh, I, I should mention that uh, cloud storage uh, is very difficult. I did, I did mention that extensively in, the la in last month's webinar, but Hadoop is also difficult. Uh, needs, needs specialized resources that are hard to find, um, and we're seeing a little bit of market moving in some other directions. So uh, you got to think about your commitment there. Um, but I would say, you know, you need the tooling. Uh, you need SQL uh, for most of these workloads. You need the simplicity of it all. Um, and I know that a lot of us, myself included, we're working on some pretty high-end stuff out there, but uh, when I'm talking about more SQL than Hadoop, I'm talking about the fact that most applications fit that mode out there. And I know we can take any single application and look into it. And I'm sure that, you know, out of the 100 applications that I might be presented with over the course of a year, that uh, there's going to be a handful that <clears throat> still make sense in Hadoop in environments that are really committed there already, et cetera. You know, but uh, the majority are not. You did that well, and in 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 few minutes. <laughs> I hope so. It's a it's a tough one, you know. Um, it, you know, we got all hot and heavy about you know Hadoop is replacing this, that, and the other thing there for a while, but you know it's settled in, and and it's it's not settled into the warehouse, in my opinion. Sure. So, um, should you not query cloud directly, and should not bring data down on premise? So, how do we access this data? Oh, uh, let's um, let's see. Let me see if I understand the question, because I think the the uh, the questioner said, should we not bring it, should we not access cloud directly, and should we not bring it down on prem? Um, I mean, those are your two choices, right? So, right. Um, for the most part, I would say keep it simple, and if you're getting performance uh, from keeping it simple, which is keep the data in the cloud where it is, then great. Do that if you're getting enough performance out of that. Don't overcomplicate it. But if you do need to bring it down, 
because you have uh, scientists that are going to pound on it all day or whatever, uh, go ahead and do so. And by the way, I, I failed to mention in, in my talk that if you take me up on doing some different things for different, uh, different, different workloads, um, do keep data virtualization in mind uh, and, and keep that in, in play in your environment. And as a matter of fact, I think every environment should have a, a data virtualization capability because if you're going to be provisioning all of these uh, different data uh, storage types, you're going to need it because you can't put all data everywhere. You can only put it in the best one or two places. And this factors into the questioner's uh, question, which is, you know, how to access that data that, that's in the cloud. Virtualization uh, can bridge that gap as well. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions here. So why aren't constraints unique indexes still important? Why aren't constraints and unique indexes still important? Well, hmm, I don't know that I would necessarily say they're, they're not important. Uh, they're not going away as rapidly as indexes are going away because indexes are going away because of other performance uh, capabilities, the performance that's inherent uh, in the new ways that the data is being stored. But in terms of constraints, uh, I want referentially integrated data. You know, for one, um, uh, I want to turn on constraints wherever I possibly can uh, in that way to ensure that. Now, if performance takes a hit, um, you know, we'll deal with that. But again, I want to keep it simple. And keeping it simple means letting the database do what it does best and, and uh, not doing, it program, doing things programmatically. But it's just, it's just something that um, I would say in comparing some of the different databases that it's it's not as important, doesn't seem as important. So I think uh, some companies are having to go back to programmatic ways to ensure integrity in the data because of some of the capabilities that are being taken away. So it's not all good. You know, cloud analytic databases, it's not all good 100%. And uh, something else is, uh, you know, 0%. It's somewhere in the middle. And this is, this is kind of a gray area. So there is some, there are always going to be some things that are, are left behind or, or laggards in terms of feature function that come along. And uh, I just don't think that this has been seen as, as important enough to, to get out there initially. So that's why I, I don't, I guess I'm guessing, but I'm guessing that's why we don't see it as much. Uh, so I think we have time for one more question. Do you see columnar data storage more uh, adaptable and cost effective for uh, evolutionary data structure changes to warehouses over other row-oriented storage? Uh, no. Um, if the data is going to have a high uh, change activity up, upon it, um, probably, and, and you're changing like multiple columns of the row on a repeated basis, like IoT type of data, maybe. Um, that's not a great candidate for columnar because uh, columnar is not great for update, let's face it. Uh, updating rows, deleting rows, uh, inserting rows, you know. Um, but if it's stable data that once you load it, you load and go, as we tend to do for data warehouse data, okay, 99% of it, um, then it's great for that. But uh, if you're thinking you're going to update, uh, I'd say no. Um, def so this is why we don't do it very much, if at all, in the operational environment. I love it. Um, you know, I am going to slip in one more question. I love it. We, you're, you're getting the. You're so efficient in your answers. <laughs> uh, on slide 25, you are showing a push of all data in a lake. Do you believe that this is a singular pattern and a and all governance should take place in the lake before distributing to data warehouses or being consumed by data science and real-time apps? So how about both? How about both? I mean, that's, to me, the data lake serves both functions. It is a data science laboratory and it's a staging area for uh, the, the push out to, let's say, the data warehouse. Okay, now there, that leaves you with some decisions. And we, we have, to, and by the way, I've, I've, I've hit kind of the tip of the iceberg of the decision-making uh, apparatus for, for being successful here. Uh, every day you make decisions, you know, after the, the selection, and they have to be good ones too, right? 
um, you have to decide what data goes in the lake, what data goes in the warehouse, and what you are going to do as an organization in the lake versus the warehouse. And I've done this for, for companies, um, but um, uh, I don't know that you know, saying anything generically would make sense here, except that in the warehouse, you're going to do your everyday reporting, your legacy stuff, uh, compiling data for analytics. But there is such a thing as a data scientist. Maybe this is the point I'll leave you with. There is such a thing as data scientists doing data science. And I'm not a data scientist, and uh, I don't know completely everything, what they're doing in my data lake. But I know they want all that data. And I know I can serve them well, and I can be successful as a data manager by giving them that data lake and, and starting to learn what they're doing so I can help them and get ahead of them so that in the future we don't have to have, uh, as we do today, some pretty uh, advanced people uh, doing all the data science in the organization. I can help them as a data manager. And that's what I want to get to. And I think we're going to have to get to the same spot in the data lake as we have got to in the data warehouse where it, it may have gone too far, but where we're, we have to almost spoon feed uh, the data out to the users uh, because they're, they're used to that. We, we highly curate the data in the data warehouse. We summarize it, we aggregate it, we derive data, we verify our calculations, uh, we just get that data ready for consumption uh, in the data warehouse. We don't do that in the data lake. Well, that does bring us to the top of the hour. William, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. And again, just a reminder uh, to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I just love all the great questions that come in. William, I'll send you all of those questions we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, and uh, I hope you all have a great day. William, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks all.